I'll, I'll pass it over, pass it over to Denny and team. Thank you very much, Karen. Really appreciate it. So, hey, before we start going into it, I wanted to just give uh, Christian and Tyler just a couple minutes to introduce themselves, and then we'll dive right into Kafka Delta Ingest. So I'll start with Christian. Christian, why don't you just do a quick introduction, let the audience know who you are. Sure. Uh, Christian Williams. I work for Scribd on the core platform team. Uh, I do a lot of core platformy type of stuff. A lot of that has to do with data engineering and also infrastructure setup using uh, 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 a, setting up a lot of uh, data platforms for the rest of the company to use. And uh, at the same time, trying to ease the pain of using those platforms. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm from sunny, humid St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, and as a result of that, I, I work remote, fully remote for Script. Thanks very much, Christian. Yeah. Tyler, uh, go for it, my friend. Yeah, so I'm the director of platform engineering here at Scribd. I oversee core platform data engineering and data operations. And those three teams are responsible for the data platform infrastructure and some of the key applications and services on top of them, like Kafka Delta Ingest, which we're going to talk about today. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Christian. Uh, Tyler, excuse me. So um, now, quick note, for since we have multiple platforms here uh, for Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A section. For LinkedIn, please put the questions directly in the comments, same as YouTube. Now, there is a slight delay with LinkedIn due to the way our Restream IO works, but nevertheless, uh, we will do our best to answer the questions. So please do chime in there and we'll do our best. Saying that, we're gonna switch it over to Christian. Uh, go ahead and start the show when it comes to talking I think we want to start off by explaining what is Kafka Delta Ingest and why'd you do it? So why don't we start with that? Sure. I, actually, I think this one is probably, uh, this qu question was meant to go to both me and Tyler, probably. I don't know. Ty Tyler, would you rather start or? I, I can get us started anyway. on this. All right, um, perfect, perfect, yeah. So uh, Scribd adopted Delta Lake um, in late 2019, early 2020. Um, we've been big fans of Delta Lake, but the biggest challenge for us as an organization is that Delta Lake historically has been very JVM oriented, specifically Spark. Uh, Scribd has a lot of Spark code running around for our data platform, but we don't use Spark or we don't use JVM based languages for pretty much anything else in the company. So we're extremely interested in uh, bringing data into and out of Delta Lake with a non-JVM language. And uh, we ended up started to, starting to talk about Rust. And the project that we're talking about today specifically is one of our key ingestion flows for our streaming data, which is we basically need to bring data from Kafka into Delta Lake as quickly as possible. Um, originally, we deployed Spark streaming applications to do that. And we saw some flaws, which, which I'll talk about a little bit later um, with that. And uh, so we sort of set off on this path of like, you know, what if we did a rust on it? <laughs> and and sort of that's where we, that's what brought us to, to here, basically. Absolutely. So now I'm going to ask the obvious question right away, which is why rust? What, what, what's, what's with the love of this particular language? It's just so <laughs> hot, man. Fair, fair. But I, I figured I would prefer a technical answer. <laughs> oh. So, uh, with Rust in particular, um, there's a couple of members of the core platform team that, uh, myself included, that have done a lot of hobby work in Rust. We're, we're, <laughs> there's a number of fans of Rust to begin with. Um, but in, when was that? Well, we, we have a... We put hot dogs. We have a, 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 yeah, yeah. We have a, a, a production application. Yeah, we Rust did. That is just that like... 2020? Yeah, I, I feel like that was mid to late 2020, and it just it just runs, and <laughs> it, it, it's happy all day, and the resource utilization is so tiny that uh, you know, it, why would you not want to build <laughs> everything in Rust after seeing that success? The, the 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 project that we had deployed was we basically needed a an Arsys log to Kafka endpoint to do some data ingestion from some some third party log providers. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things out there. We actually started with our syslog, which is an off the, the shelf tool and ran into a number of problems with it. And um, so we ended up building this little daemon and put it out, put it into production and 
sort of didn't spend a lot of time thinking about optimization or, or making it run fast and it just ran fast. And that gave, at least me, I can't speak for anybody else, that gave me a lot of confidence that we could use Rust for other data, high throughput data ingestion problems and not spend a lot of time worrying about the correctness of the application or the performance of the application because Rust, uh, a lot of the characteristics of Rust just sort of encourage you to do sort of the right things from the get-go um, that lead to very high performance uh, daemons, which is interesting from a data platform standpoint. Got it. And so that, because of that, the, that basically introduced the Delta Rust API project itself, which was started, I want to say last March, I think, but then got into so the repo. One of our, one of our colleagues, QP started yeah. it like right. almost on a dare, it seemed like. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he started like, I think he, I think I nerd sniped him and he wrote the first sort of Delta log protocol parsing code for Delta RS over a couple of weekends, just because it was like, well, I wonder if we could do this in Rust. I don't know. It's, I hadn't looked into Delta Lake that much at the time. And so he sort of got the ball rolling. And then st late 2020, we started to see really, like there's a little bit more pickup. We had a good proper reader in place. Um, and so we started to really invest in the writer side of things um, in late 2020. and. That was the foundation. Del like making Delta RS capable of writing was the foundation for Kafka Delta Ingest. Makes sense. And so the the call out then is the uh, at this point the Delta Rust API is pretty much production ready, right? So we have we have Kafka Delta Ingest running in production. Um, so yes, I would consider it production ready for reader and writer use cases in Rust. I, there are production use cases for Delta RS in Python uh, for the read side of that. Um, so one of our uh, one of the other committers, a guy named Florian from Back Market, um, I believe he's over in France. They have they've had Delta RS the Python bindings, and that's just a pip install of Delta Lake. Um, they've had that running in production, I think, for a couple of months, uh, if not more, at this point. So yeah, definitely ready to go. <laughs> Rock on. So which I think this is a, needs to a natural segue to talk about Kafka Delta Ingest, which is uh, one we you've already described a little bit about why you want to do that. So uh, Christian, why don't you show some of the architecture diagram of it uh, for starters. And then Tyler, if you want to maybe start off with the rehashing, like like what are the challenges? What, what are the issues? What, what led you to go down this route? Cool. So uh, you can probably see my diagram at this point, we right? We can. Excellent. Um, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to walk through some aspects of the, of the high level architecture and, uh, some, some of the design as well related to Kafka Delta ingest, um, at a super high level, like each instance of Kafka Delta ingest is, uh, consumes from one topic writes to one table and it joins a, a Kafka consumer group. And uh, that consumer group, uh, Kafka, uh, Kafka consumer groups, um, probably some people who are on the call are familiar with how Kafka consumer groups work. And it's basically a membership protocol uh, that allows you to have like one or more uh, consumers from a single topic that uh, each consumer from a subset of partitions. And um, that consumer group membership is something that, that underlies our auto scale approach. Uh, uh, it makes it easy for us to just let use Kafka to manage partition assignment for each member of the group. And then internally we, we manage rebalance events, which happen if, you know, new consumers are added to the same group. So, you know, in the diagram on the left, you see we've got one Kafka topic. On the right, we have one Delta table. We could have one or many Kafka Delta ingest workers um, ingesting from that topic and writing to the same Delta table. Um, the other little bit I'll mention here for this diagram is that we run daily Delta optimize and vacuum jobs in Databricks to uh, kind of compact and clean up uh, all those kind of smaller-ish um, 
files that we write while we're streaming. I want to mention something on this, if you don't mind, Christian, real quick. Sure. I was talking about this yeah. use case with somebody yesterday, and this pattern has actually been replicated a number of times where if you think about our streaming data is coming in in the sort of like top line of Kafka, Topic, Kafka Delta, and Just a Delta Lake table, that means we get data to customers that want to use it as quickly as possible. But within the context of like a date stamp partition, um, it's just not optimized for queries. So we're, we're, we're sort of optimizing in, in, a, in a day for freshness. And then afterwards, we're running this Delta Optimize in vacuum um, to make sure that for the long-term query needs that we have, you know, optimizing, optimizing for performance. And so by combining yeah. these two, we basically get as much of the best of both worlds as we can for, uh, you know, rapid delivery of data and then high performance as, you know, the table gets larger or we look back in historical partitions. Yep. Well said. Um, so... Uh, Sorry if I like totally diving. threw you off your jam. <laughs> no, you're not at all that. that. <laughs> no, no, no. I, actually, that was, I, I feel like a fantastic addendum. Uh, all right, back to you, Christian. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, actually, before, so, before, we even, before we even get to that, but we, we're still talking about the overall architecture. One of the things that I, I did want to talk, and maybe it's a little too early or a little too late, but it was the, the issues around, for example, how do, with Kafka Delta Ingest, you're definitely doing concurrently consistent writes. So what were some of the issues that, uh, or that you were running into when it came to that? Concurrently consistent writes. I feel like this is one, uh, basically I'd like to say, can we hold that question? I think we're gonna hit it. If, if we don't- Okay, perfect, perfect. Ask Let's, it again. <laughs> you got it. Let's do it, let's do it. My bad, but. Okay. Okay, yeah, so first off, I wanted to kind of walk through like the basic, this is like a super high level um, walkthrough of like the run loop design for Kafka Delta Ingest. Um, and I, ju I just wanted to walk through this so, so the audience can kind of see like how it works at a really high level with leaving out a lot of the dirty details. Um, so in Kafka Delta Ingest, the first thing we do is we, we, we subscribe to a Kafka topic and we know that we're going to deliver all the messages from that topic to a specific uh, Delta table. Um, so the first thing we do is we, we're using this crate called RD Kafka, which is an awesome rust crate for uh, Kafka consumption and production. Um, first thing we do is we, we start a run loop. We await a message. When a message is received, we deserialize it. Um, after we deserialize it, we have some little basic transformations, with, with, which I'll add some detail to later, uh, to uh, provide some minor enrichments to the message if they are desired. Uh, and then we buffer it. Um, the reason we buffer messages, well, uh, I'll talk about this more later as well. Uh, but it, you know, just in general, we're 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 trying to uh, create like a tuning dial for people to use so that they can like kind of choose between read availability versus query execution time. Um, so we buffer messages for a while. We check a few um, like hard parameters to decide when we want to write our buffers to a parquet file. Uh, if, if we decide we should do that, we write parquet files, uh, we flush our buffers, and we write delta transactions. Um, so first off, focusing in on that, that first step, you see this, this green circle with a one in it. Uh, this is our message deserialized step. So at the moment, we, we only support JSON message formats. I'm sure lots of nerds are, are scoffing right now because squeezing every- How dare you? Format, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm a nerd, right? I count myself in that group. Uh, but like, I, and I agree, like squeezing every last inch of performance out of over the wire protocols is, a, it, it's a really great way to spend your day. Um, but JSON is just, 
it's it, it's such a nice common denominator that everybody in our organization is very familiar with. Uh, they were using it before I got here, uh, writing it to Kafka. Christian, could um, you maybe talk about how how that JSON lines up with the Delta table? Like at uh, some point we have to convert this stuff. Like you're de we're deserializing, but it, I actually don't know at what point we we do in this list. We say like, does this message actually fit in the delta table? Do you know what I mean? Uh, fit in the delta. Well, I mean, uh, as far as like it, it's it, each JSON message is one row in a delta right. table. Yeah, is that is that what you were? Ooh, so where do we line up? Like, all right, I've got a couple of fields in this JSON. Those have to map to a column at some point, right? Like they have right. to. Yeah. So where so, does that so, happen? Yeah. So what we do with Kafka Delta ingest is the uh, any column that is specified in the Delta schema is a field in the original JSON message. So it's it's like a one-to-one -one in terms of field name and data type. Um, we have a thing called transformations, which I'm going to get to in just a moment, which adds a little more uh, flexibility to that. But just to make sure I answered your, your initial question, did I? You did sort of, and I, I want to make sure that we keep the appropriate depth here so we don't okay. give, like, I, I guess go to the, like, you're Kafka Delta ingest expert. You, Misha, and QP know this stuff sure. in and out. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it is a complex project. Um, so I just yeah, want sure. to make sure that we don't get too deep into the, uh, like, how Kafka Delta ingest works. Because gotcha. at a high level, okay. like like this flow is actually really useful, I think, because we've got that deserialize and like we queue up these things. How does like one process is what you had, I think, on the, the previous one. How does this work when you've got a lot of data coming in? Maybe you could talk a, a little bit about that. Like there's a lot of data coming in. You've got this sort yep. of multiple we'll dotted lines here. Like Yeah. Uh, I, I think we get there, if I'm not mistaken, in, in uh, some of the follow-up slides. Right, um, let's get there. All right. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, do your thing, buddy. Over, <laughs> yep, I'll gloss over this a bit. So, bas basically, I just wanted to, you know, I'll, I'll tie this off and say, right now, at Scribd, we just use JSON. We we don't support other formats, um, and that's basically because it works well for our our organization. Um, uh, so we hit this message transform step, and this this hits on one of one of the other questions that you mentioned. Uh, uh, the The reason we have transformations is, you know, we we want to provide this little fuzzy space where we we can help connect the dots between front end applications that don't want to do don't want to know too much about the data warehouse. Uh, and we want to also ease the downstream burden of transforming a super raw ingestion table into something useful uh, for downstream jobs. Um, so you know you could you you could think of these as use use cases um, as a front end application developer. Uh, I want to send messages I'm handling straight to Kafka without doing extra work for fields that are required by the warehouse schema, so that I can stay focused on front end and not have to learn too much about the warehouse. From a downstream uh, data engineer perspective, um, I don't want to have to include the same calculated query in every query I run against an ingestion, ingestion table. I also don't want to create an extra job to transform the ingestion table and write it to a nearly identical table with a few extra fields. Um, when you say extra so, fields, you're talking about like, these are like timestamps and metadata about ingestion, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you could think like, like, if, if we just took exactly what we got from Kafka and wrote it into a Delta table, but it turns out every downstream consumer also needs some other field, literally every one. Like, do we want to have like a downstream job that, that calculates these fields or, or I mean, no. uh, might we just <laughs> I go don't. ahead and calculate that calculate. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm just looking at the you know, the time. Uh, can, make them available immediately. Immediately, we can we can skip all that. Do you think sure. I'm looking at your, your deck? I think the diagram that you have on slide four is actually a really useful one for us to jump to. This one, you want to go here? This one, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think this is yeah. an interesting diagram. All right, Let, let's let's talk about this one a bit. So um, this sits on some, some things we haven't introduced yet, but um, you know, we're going from one Kafka topic to one Delta table. A given Delta table does have multiple partitions that we, could need to write to when when we're running uh, Kafka Delta ingest, um, and so the way partitioning works in Kafka, you know, you can use a message key to send events to specific Kafka parti partitions, but most often we do not do that. So you get like this random distribution uh, as a producer when you're writing messages to Kafka, um, and you know, so the diagram we're looking at right now, we have one topic, we have two Kafka Delta ingest workers. Uh, our topic has five partitions. Three of them are going to one of the workers and the other two is going, uh, are, are going to the other worker. Um, so this actually hits on one of the challenges that, that we face in Kafka Delta ingest. We, we need to be able to consume from multiple, multiple partitions and we need to be able to write to multiple delta partitions. And delta partition, in our case, is usually a date stamp. So, um, you know, this is especially useful in when we're crossing time boundaries. Um, so, like, if if we're around midnight on October seventh, for example, we're going to be receiving messages in Kafka Delta ingest, some of which are from, uh, some of which should be written to the October 6th, uh, October 7th um, Delta partition, and some of which should be written to the October 8th partition. And so when we do our write, um, we have to separate those messages into different uh, files. Um, at the same time, the other thing this diagram shows is the fact that, um, each worker has a, an exclusive subset of the total number of partitions assigned to, to it. And so this has an impact on what our transaction file that we write out in Delta in, ends up looking like. Uh, and, and this actually leads right into this this next slide. Um, actually, this is perfect. Before we get into um, this, I, I did want to do a high level question, uh, if that's okay. Which sort of leads to what you're talking about. Which is one is that if you run into uh, this is a question from the, the LinkedIn community. It's like, how do you actually like? Like because people are so used to the idea of Kafka and Spark, where in terms of managing offset, you know what happens when the failure occurs. How how do you deal with that within the context of Kafka Delta ingest? Which I believe you're le it leads into what you're talking about. But I wanted to pr provide that setup. Yep, fantastic. Um, so so we use the Delta transaction log uh, to do this. Um, so interesting story. Um, where are we on time? Actually, make it a quick one. Yeah, like yeah, that trying, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like make making the, the one minute answer, not the five minute, the, not the ten minute answer. <laughs> Got, gotcha. Yeah. It, okay. So interesting story. Early on in our Kafka Delta ingest development, we we were going to use this external write ahead log, which is what the Spark Kafka connector does. Um, but QP, who Tyler mentioned before, uh, realized the protocol allows for us to do something different. He had a conversation with some Databricks folks and we ended up doing a much different thing that really simplified our job in Kafka Delta ingest. And yeah, it all boils down to this Texan app, uh, action that 
we that, that is specified by the Delta protocol. Um, and basically, when we do a write to Delta, we include multiple Texan actions. Uh, and tex, I'm pronouncing TXN as Texan. So, so at, I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt that stands for transaction, but because Christian has yeah. a nice sense of humor, we're calling it, he's calling it Texan. But this it's, is in It stands for transaction, but if you're trying to have a conversation with real people about a transaction action in the transaction log, you'll drive yourself insane. So we called yes. it a Texan so that we could actually talk about what was happening here. <laughs> Yeah, agree. I, I'd like to emphasize that because transaction is, whoa, huge overloaded term. Texan, not so much. I say that. Anyways, keep we going, know exactly keep going, what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, you're just making me want barbecue every time you say it. That's the problem. But anyways, go on, please. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Uh, so, you know, we, we write multiple Texan actions and we write one per Kafka partition. So we, in, in this example here, we have a topic that has nine partitions being handled by a single worker. And we've written a Texan action for each partition. And the version identifier that we include in each action is the offset that we left off from, from Kafka. That way, if a process terminates and when it comes back up, it's assigned one of these partitions. Let's say it's assigned partition eight, six, and five. It, it can go look in the Delta tra transaction log to see, all right, what was the last offset for partitions eight, six, and five? And it knows exactly where to start from with, when it begins consuming from Kafka again. So it'll ultimately, it'll see, oh, I'm at, wow, that's a big number, uh, 59,411,172. So I need to do a seek and then start consuming. Uh, and then that way I know I'm picking exact, exactly wh where the service as a whole left off from, uh, from the source. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense actually. So yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the, the next slide here is, you know, any given entry in the Delta transaction log, it, it doesn't only include text and actions, it also includes the actual files that were written. And so those nine text and actions correspond to this one add. So this worker was consuming from nine partitions, it wrote a data file, and uh, that file is referenced here in the path. Um, so we know that at version, whatever version of the Delta law this represents. Let's let's say it's version, uh, you know, 100,000, I don't know. Um, we know that at that version, we were up to uh, it, it, the source consumption. It was represented by the text and actions shown in the, in, in the previous slide. Perfect. Okay, so I'm actually to to move things along. I do want to I do want to talk to Tyler uh, a little bit about the cost structure and things of that uh, related to this. But before I do that, I did want to ask uh, one question from LinkedIn, uh, specifically. Is that, well, in in your case, uh, because I'm sure it happens often, how do you deal with duplicates like what, of uh, uh, coming in, or is it is, in your scenario? Is it just because you're able to? deal with the duplicates right from the get-go because of the way this is set up. I'm just curious, well, how, how do you solve that? Yeah, we use offset filtering to deal with duplicates. Um, so yeah, I, I'd put it this way. If there's a duplicate in Kafka, we aren't going to handle it. You, you, um, Kafka does provide duplicate um, pre prevention uh, settings. Um, Kafka is you know, like the original um, Kafka spec was at least once uh, message message delivery, but they now have settings that you can use if you choose to, uh, to do exactly once message delivery. So you can hear those on, in, on the Kafka side. On our side, on our side as a consumer of Kafka, if there is a duplicate in Kafka, we're gonna write a duplicate. 
But if you have set up the appropriate um, producer side settings to for exactly once delivery instead of at least once delivery, um, we should not um, create duplicates on our side because we're going to consume from Kafka. We're going to do filtering by offset to make sure we don't write the offset, the same offset twice. And so you should only see that record once in the Delta Lake table. Perfect, perfect. Okay, then I'm going to switch gears a little bit because one of the things that I alluded to in the beginning, but uh, we didn't really get dive into it, but is basically what are, were some of the design challenges? And specifically, the one I'm interested in is the, the fact that, you know, to, be, to put it, S3 is kind of consistent. It's actually not like, it's not fully consistent. Uh, from a transactional standpoint. And since you guys are in AWS, how did you solve that problem? Just because that's actually a sizable chunk of how you, of, of the, of what's amazing about Kafka Delta Ingest as well. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, we use it, ultimately we use, use pessimistic locking at a lower layer uh, is the most direct answer to your question. Um, and we use DynamoDB, since we're in AWS, to provide that pessimistic locking. And so... Yeah, go back to that first for, slide, Christian. <laughs> the, what's not pictured here is the, the DynamoDB table that's yeah. off to the side. <laughs> that's that's yeah. where all the locking is going on. And just one of the yeah. things that has been really cool to watch over the last, um, the last few weeks as we've been rolling this into production and getting things sorted is we've actually brought some of that DynamoDB locking logic into our into item number two here where we're doing the Delta optimized stuff and other things that are interacting with this Delta Lake table. Um, so yep. sorry, uh, I'm stealing the mic from you, Christian. <laughs> no, no um, it's totally, totally fine. You, you, you did it right. So uh, I think the, uh, the other, besides optimize, the other thing is anytime we do a schema alter, yeah, we so do. pretty much yep. any interaction with a Kafka Delta ingest um, sort of owned table, we have been adding support to our other tools that are going to interact with Delta tables to do the DynamoDB lock coordination that needs to be done. Um, I had something else in, in the notes about the, the locking that I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, yeah, let me mention this. Uh, if, you use, if you're running on S3, um, put if absent is the missing uh, thing. So you've got some eventual consistency concerns. Um, and if you're running on Databricks, they actually sort of like make this problem disappear because they have the S3 commit service that's sort of hiding behind the scenes. Um, but in our case, you know, we're, we've got this non-Spark writer. We don't, you know, we're not able to really interact with that S3 commit service. And that's why we added this DynamoDB locking mechanism uh, to ensure that we still had consistency. Um, when we were doing the rights to the Delta table. And I want to take, uh, while I'm just sort of like going through this topic, uh, Lucas on Zoom actually asked, I'm going to answer one of these questions. Uh, can you go to slide uh, two, Christian, that diagram? So I asked, why is there an in intermediate step to flush the Parquet files first and why not direct, write directly to the Delta table? So uh, the structure of a Delta table, it's actually Parquet files sitting on object store adjacent to a JSON transaction log. And so we actually have to write the Parquet files first in order to make the write to that Delta log um, with the appropriate, like, this is the file that actually contains the data. So on the reader side, when Spark or something else comes in and reads the Delta table, it's actually reading that JSON file and then looking for all these like add actions that Christian had mentioned to say like, oh, here are the actual Parquet files that make up this table. Now I need to go grab those Parquet files and load those into memory and do whatever I've got to do with them. Um, so when Christian, maybe you can tell me, I actually don't know where we do our DynamoDB locking in this flow um, to make sure that we have that consistent write. Yeah, uh, we do it in the one with the green four circle. That's okay. where we obtain the, the DynamoDB lock. And everything you said before is right on the money, basically, we, we can write Parquet files to the same directory all day long and a Delta query will not read them in, until it sees <laughs> it in the transaction. In the log, yeah. So, yeah. So, so we obtain that lock when we're completing the transaction. Um, and then we, we write the transaction file and that tells, 
it, it basically provides the appropriate snapshot isolation level that we need so that readers will only see that file after it's included in the Delta log. And that Delta table, by the way, um, it basically looks like an append only Delta table. So we only have mm -hmm. appends going into it. Um, so we can we can upload those uh, those parquet files. You know, let's say we've got a hundred megabyte parquet file, and that takes a, a second or two to upload. That can happen from any of these Kafka Delta ingest uh, uh, processes that might be running. But where we really have to do that coordination is on that JSON file. That's the the Delta transaction log, um, because we're yeah, lacking this right. this put if absent semantic um, in AWS S three. Right now, Christian, I don't think we have anybody that's running this on Azure or GCP, right? Not that uh, I'm aware of. Um, so Delta not, RS. Yeah. Delta RS can I support mean, both of those now. Um, right. I think I, I remember seeing the GCS, uh, so the Google Cloud Storage support come in for the Delta RS. In theory, Kafka Delta Ingest can work on another cloud provider. But we just haven't done it yet. So the Kafka Delta Ingest works well in production in AWS. Uh, like join us in Slack if you <laughs> you want to talk about how we can bring it to another cloud. Um, but Script is deployed in AWS, so that's where we're focusing. Yeah. yeah and, I, I, and one thing I did want to add, basically, because you this the the need for a lock store here, a la DynamoDB, is specific because of S3. In the case of uh, the other cloud providers, uh, at least in terms of Azure and uh, Google Cloud, they don't have, uh, they, they actually have consistent transactional consistency. So at least from, from a lock store perspective, that's not needed. It, it, the rest I of- I believe that should go away, yeah. Still, yeah, exactly. That part of it will go away. The rest of Cocoa Delta and just would stay the same, obviously, but specifically mm -hmm. just the lock store mechanism should go away. Yep, that should be the case. Um, <laughs> basically, basically, it should be easier to to deploy Kafka Delta ingest on anything anything other than AWS. And, and one thing to note is, by the way, we are working with the community for uh, open sourcing the NS3 commit service, basically. Uh, and so there's actually both the work that these gentlemen have been doing, and also there's the work that has uh, been run, run by some of the folks over at Samba TV to actually go ahead and do that as well. So we're still working on with the community in terms of uh, open sourcing that portion of it as well. So just as an FYI. Nice, yeah. Cool. Um, the, the, the lock store, it, it ends up being kind of an awkward leaky abstraction for for us at the moment, yeah. uh, just because it's like, you know, at the high level, we're using optimistic concurrency, but we have to use pessimistic locking deep down to make the S three S three writes safe, um, so it's kind of so you have to kind of know know what you're doing um, at the higher layer uh, when you're when you're doing your S three writes, um, and that 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 leaks out today today because of that missing put if absent semantic. Yeah. Okay. So I actually want to switch a little bit because uh, and this is more directed to you, Tyler. Like basically to talk about the operational concerns like in terms of an apple apples comparison of like you know of spark to rust about uh how why how has this massively benefited scrib <laughs> your environment by doing building this uh, uh the system right. here lucas also asked you know what were the issues you saw with spark streaming um right so that's related to exactly <laughs> that, yeah. um, so uh our first sort of version of of this our first deployment um can you stop sharing, Christian? Yep. Our, our first deployment um, was very, very Spark-based. And there's a couple of issues that we identified with the Spark streaming approach. One was you know, running high throughput Spark streaming applications is a non-trivial exercise in terms of the infrastructure cost, um, you know, pretty much you know, you've, you're carrying the JVM with you, of course, so you've got that. But in most cases, Spark streams, uh, Spark structured streaming applications are running on a cluster of machines um, that's going to stay always on uh, at the time. And I believe this is still the case unless Databricks has announced something in the last you know week or so that I wasn't told about. There's no auto scaling as well with Spark structured streaming, at least uh, deployed on uh, the Databricks platform. But I don't think I've seen Spark structured streaming auto scale anywhere else. <laughs> Uh, so when we look at data streams that are a variable throughput, 
we had a lot of operational challenges early on with getting clusters to the right size. So as our data, growth, data rates would grow, we would reach this sort of tipping point where um, applications would fall behind and we'd see consumer lag spike in Datadog and we'd have to go basically redeploy the Spark streaming application with a newer cluster with more resources in order to keep up with the data growth. And you know, getting alerted on a weekend or in the evening that you know your Spark streaming application can no longer handle the throughput of data that's coming at it is not my uh, ideal way to be spending my time. Um, but on top of that, it's basically required a little bit more care and feeding um, as an application, as far as an application goes, as opposed to some of the things that we would deploy into, say, ECS where we sort of set up auto scale uh, configurations, we wrap things up in a container of some form, we deploy it, and then we kind of forget about it until something goes wrong. So Spark's like for an online, you know, high throughput application, Spark streaming that does no transformations, you know, nothing interesting is going on. We're not using any of the power of Spark to get data from Kafka into Delta. Uh, you know, the overhead of Spark was just not right for the problem domain. Um, yeah, and one yeah. thing I definitely want to add, is because you're going to allude to that real soon, especially because I, I will even <laughs> help to peg it, which is like, it's the cost, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I sort of want to overemphasize that point. Like, yeah, I, you know, first I'll defend Databricks a little bit, just a little time bit, which is to say that, yeah, you know, I got to do it a little bit, right? Which is basically, yes, yeah. it, it, we, we definitely heard your concerns and you're not mm -hmm. the only one. So in terms of the auto scaling, so that is that it, it, nothing's been announced. You're absolutely correct. But that is something mm -hmm. that's being actively worked on. By the same token, even if we had this service available, Mm -hmm. At least from me putting, you know, putting on my hat, my engineering hat as opposed to the Databricks hat, right? Mm -hmm. um, it still wouldn't make much sense, right? The because of exactly what you said, there's no transformations going on, so you're just going to be able to write from Kafka directly to yeah. Delta Lake, and uh, which really leads to the performance and the cost. So why don't we dive into that? What, like, what were the massive performance and cost benefits for by by using the service that you built? Yeah. On the on the Spark comment, like we we have other streaming applications in production that are doing like right, right, exactly, aggregations right, yeah. and like they're doing real work. Like one of the things that that really motivated me, made me to to start looking at this as a, a possibility is we sort of chose Spark because we had to have Spark to write into Delta Lake. If it weren't for that requirement, this use case would have never been in Spark because it's just not a Spark use case. Uh, you know, doing awesome query things is where Spark really shines. Um, so we, have, uh, we haven't completed our migration of all of our um, data streams over into Kafka Delta Ingest. We've got a, a number that are over there. Um, and Christian and I were doing math yesterday, which was really funny because we're both terrible at it. We're like, wait, this can't be right. All right, let's run this again, uh, just to, <laughs> to make sure that we, were, we had something to, to share that was realistic. But when we look at the actual, um, the resource utilization, we basically can fit a hell of a lot more messages per second. And, you know, there is going to be some variability. I, I use messages per second because that's the, the useful metric that we have. But, um, you know, different width fields or different width rows will, will sort of perform a little bit differently. Or if you've got very uh, painful things to deserialize in JSON, that will uh, behave differently. But we, you know, we can fit you know, thousands, uh, you know, a unit of a thousand messages per second in very, very comfortably into a half vCPU on, on, uh, on ECS, which is where this is deployed right now. And so when we extrapolated uh, some of these initial findings out, like Kafka Delta ingest in terms of the actual operational cost is like 18, 18, 20% of what the original cost was for ingesting that data with Spark. So like, if we look at just the, the actual invoice that we're gonna get at the end of the month, there's this huge drop that we're gonna see because of, of Kafka Delta ingest. But the thing that's probably more important to me is the auto scaling, you know, setting up ECS with auto scaling. And then, you know, this is just a daemon that looks like a bunch of other daemons that we have that are processing data and bringing it into the data platform. And that's 
operationally, as far as the team goes and, and sort of the skills that we've got, that's so much easier of a problem. Like so many more people on the planet are deploying Docker containers into ECS very successfully, reliably, you know, day in and day out, as opposed to Spark streaming applications, which is a little bit more of a niche uh, sort of domain to, to get really good at. Um, and so I'm expecting that we're going to see a lot less um, people time that goes into maintaining these these uh, these daemons because it's just going to like once it's up and running, we're just going to leave it alone and it's going to con continue ingesting data uh, until we're done with it. Wow, those those are some pretty impressive numbers. So we're talking one half of a vCPU can take care easily handle a thousand messages per second. And with our workloads, eight, yeah. With your current set of workloads and 18 to 20 percent of the original ingestion cost. So massively easier. Yeah. And at the same time, auto scaling because you're just using EC2 with auto scale. Um ECS. So it's ECS, oh, EC2, ECS. ECS. Oh my goodness. Yes, ECS for auto scale. So mm -hmm. it's easier to maintain, easier for people to just get it up and running, significantly mm -hmm. cheaper and faster. Yeah. The, the I, th I think the um, the availability of ECS with Fargate is one of the reasons why that's so so cheap. So this is in Fargate. We don't use the sort of classic ECS. Um, sure enough. But the like it just looks like an application. That's to me that that's the biggest the biggest win is it's so simple. Um, you know, slap it in a container, ship it to production, and call it a day. <laughs> so so. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Danny Lee, not not related to me at all. I don't know who he is, but he did. Is this your alter ego? It, no, it's not my alter with ego. With the beard. Honestly. Yeah, exactly. The one with the beard, you know, with the goatee and everything. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm going back to Star Trek, you know, references. The, the original <laughs> series. The original series. Um, um, uh, but it, it, it's a little quote that I actually like, uh, that like to say. It's like, people time is the most money time. So great solution. Yeah, And that's yeah. pretty much what we want to call out. This is really cool. One of the things, and I, it's on my long to-do list um, to write a blog post to capture this. I, I dragged AWS on Twitter a little bit about uh, this S3 problem that we hit. We actually, like Kafka Delta Streams, uh, which is the Spark version, we ran into an S3 bug, which is like unheard of. S3 is the most bulletproof service I've ever seen on the planet. But we ran into a consistency bug with AWS S3 that has taken six plus months to sort of dive into and, and really understand. And AWS hasn't been able to fix it yet. Um, there's no data corruption. Like if you're using S3, don't worry about it. If you haven't seen it yet, you're fine. Uh, even if you see it, like there's no problem um, with, our, with our Delta tables. But what that would mean is we would have periodically Spark streaming jobs would fail and go offline. And that means an engineer has to go look at what went wrong and make sure, oh, it's that bug we saw. It's just that happening again and not something else. And so we've had to babysit this Spark streaming version of this infrastructure a lot more than I originally anticipated. Um, and so the fact that we're, you know, we're gonna be able to sort of set it and forget it with Kafka Delta ingest is to me the biggest, <laughs> the biggest success as part of this project. Um, Cause it's, you know, there's just a lot fewer moving parts. Um, so fewer so, things to go wrong. All right, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanted at least to, 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 to ask the question, what comes next? And then of course, uh, call out that everybody should be joining us on Delta user Slack anyways to ask more questions. But, but let, what comes next? Like, you know, what, what's going on with Delta Rust? What's going on with Kafka Delta? Why don't you tell us what's, what's coming up down the pike? Christian, why don't you start by talking about the, the thing that you, this thing, yeah. This is the good Bam, one. there we go, perfect. Is he muted? Yeah. Can you? He may be. Are you muted? Yeah, Christian, oh, you're still sorry. Muted. Yes. Sorry. Yes. There we no, uh, <laughs> yeah. Apologies. All right. So the very next thing, this is currently in progress. Uh, we're implementing a small feature to allow explicit starting offsets for a Kafka Delta stream. We need this be because we are, are, are curr currently migrating. Uh, we have several new streams that are on Kafka Delta ingest already, but we want to migrate our existing uh, Kafka Delta streams that are using Spark streaming over to these. So this is this is kind of a, like a stopgap solution so that we can just terminate 
our existing Spark streaming jobs and then start Kafka Delta in ingest and pick up where it left off. Um, so we got this one. Um, the next, uh, another one we have is, you know, I personally really want, want the ability to have these like kind of cron trigger want style um, scheduled jobs for Kafka Delta ingest because uh, we do have a lot of low volume topics where we've just got like, you know, a, a small, you know, a, a pretty low volume of messages per second for a lot of jobs, basically tiny ingestion streams. Uh, it feels really wrong to have uh, an ECS task running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and just very gradually, incrementally um, writing these uh, messages into Delta. Uh, it, it'd be really great if, if we could schedule these jobs that would run hourly or a couple times a day and, and just s s suck whatever's in Kafka from the latest offset into Delta. Um, and, and we could s save uh, a good bit of money here. Um, I, these are two big ones uh, at the moment. We've got a couple other possibilities for the future uh, that are definitely not in like the near view, but <laughs> Um, I should mention that these are also not things that Scribd's going to do. <laughs> right, right, right. Sure. So, if you're interested in Kafka Delta ingest without the Kafka part, like if you're you're, you're keen on Kinesis, um, for example, then like come join us. Like I'm like Kafka Delta ingest is part of the Delta project, so it's not Scribd's baby. Um, but our our sort of world is JSON on Kafka. So if you're interested in not JSON or not on Kafka, then Sharpen your your Rust tools and come join us. Um, I should mention as well from the Delta RS standpoint, we are waiting on an up Gesundheit. We are waiting on an upstream uh, uh, dependency to make a major release because we're sort of pinning some things to do the next Delta RS release. Um, and then after that, we're planning on tagging a Kafka Delta ingest 1.0. Um, but where we are right now, you know, this is production ready. You can go grab it from from GitHub and and you know create a build and deploy that to production. And I think you would see similar results to what we've seen here at Scribd. Perfect. That's what's coming so that's a, it's perfect. Thank you very much. That's an excellent segue. So Karen, we're going to be closing up in the next few seconds here. But again, I will overemphasize. Uh, Karen's already sent a a link to everybody on LinkedIn. Zoom and YouTube. So join us on the Delta user Slack. If you have more questions, uh, Christian, Tyler, myself, um, I'm not very useful, but nevertheless, we are online to go ahead and answer your Delta Rust questions, Kafka Delta Ingest questions. So uh, I wanted to say thank you very much for, uh, to Christian and Tyler for answering all these questions uh, for presenting us. here. Yeah, this was awesome. Um, so apologies to anybody that we were not able to answer the questions online. So again, join us in the Slack and we will answer your questions there. Karen, uh, <laughs> why don't we wrap it up, please? Thanks, Denny. Thanks, Tyler and Christian again. Um, great to have you. And for everyone, just a reminder that the recording is available on YouTube. Uh, so check it out there. And yeah, we hope you all will join the Delta Lake Slack. Uh, with that, everyone, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Take care.